let's try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. As many of you know, I'm Horace Anderson. I'm the Dean here at the Elizabeth Haub School of Law, and I am pleased today to introduce the 2023 Dyson Distinguished Lecture. It's my pleasure to welcome this year's, as this year's Dyson Lecturer, Chris Rapp, who is an accomplished public servant, family historian, author, and thought leader at the intersection of social identity, civic innovation, and equity. From his own unique perspective, Chris will speak today about how social identity influences connectedness, community building, and placemaking in divisive times. I think we could all use such a lecture right now. His lecture will address, will also address issues of diversity in higher education and the recent Supreme Court decision in Students for Fair Admission v. Harvard. The Dyson Distinguished Lecture has had a rich history here at Haub Law for more than 40 years. It was endowed in 1982 by a gift from the Dyson Foundation in honor of the late Charles H. Dyson, a financier, entrepreneur, and philanthropist who was also a 1930 graduate, trustee, and longtime benefactor of Pace University. Mr. Dyson was considered a pioneer in the field of leverage buyouts and was best known for his government service. He worked for uh, the Roosevelt administration, that's the Franklin Roosevelt administration, and served in World War II. In 1954, he founded the Dyson Kissner Moran Corporation, a New York investment company that has become one of the nation's largest privately held corporations. Pace University's Dyson College of Arts and Sciences was named in his honor. The Dyson Endowment provides us with an opportunity to further Haub Law's educational mission by encouraging and fostering scholarly legal contributions. Prior Dyson lectures, and no pressure, Chris, prior Dyson lectures have been delivered by Dr. Cornell West, Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, <laughs> and EEOC Commissioner Kai Feldblum, among many others. You're right up there. You're right up there. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Professor Bridget Crawford, who will formally introduce our speaker. Thank you so much for being here on this very special occasion at Haub Law. I have known Chris Rabb for 35 years plus. Um, and I thought I would tell you a little bit about this extraordinary guest we have today. I cannot recall with specificity when I met Chris for the very first time, but I know it's when he was a fresh-faced 18-year-old on the Yale campus uh, as an incoming freshman I was a year older and I thought myself very wise at age 19. We lived in the same residential college. That's Yale's fancy name for a dorm. We ended up having many friends and many interests in common. It was also, just to give you a sense of the period in time, the very end of the anti-apartheid era on campus. Uh, and many of us, myself included, were still reeling from the regressive um, economic policies of the Reagan and Bush eras. Chris was then, as a teenager, and continues to be now, as an adult, someone of remarkable good humor, energy, and integrity. It was Chris Rabb as a college student who drew much needed attention to the literal walls and windows of the places where we lived, studied, ate, slept, and had the usual college fun. I'm not allowed to tell those stories. In our particular residential college, then called Calhoun College, uh, there were several carvings, portraits, uh, and plaques that venerated Yale alumnus John C. Calhoun, 
the seventh vice president of the United States and a slaveholder and a defender of American slavery. It was Chris Rabb who began raising good trouble, necessary trouble, about one particularly egregious uh, depiction of Calhoun, a stained glass pane showing Calhoun towering over an enslaved uh, individual. Chris brought this to the attention of the college leadership and said, and I quote, this is literally a form of institutional racism, end quote. And Chris has dedicated his life to ending institutional, interpersonal, and all forms of uh, racism and injustice. To make a long story short, what Chris Rabb began as a young, very young man, um, uh, informed by his understanding of the past, informed by his commitment to equality, with his powerful advocacy, began a multi-year process that led not only to the removal of that piece of stained glass, but also the renaming of Calhoun College itself, the first time Yale has ever renamed a building because of its connections to slavery. Yale has also uh, begun investigating its own involvement in American slavery. I have followed Chris's post-college career with great interest, admiration, and appreciation. Uh, he has uh, been a teacher. He is a writer. He has written an incredibly incisive book, Invisible Capital, How Unseen Forces Shape Entrepreneurial Opportunity, and Chris is an incredibly hard worker. He also balances humor and family to temper all of that hard work. He's a thought leader. And in traveling with Chris for the last 25 years, I have identified, this is going to be a surprise to you, Chris, I have identified four strands of your human agenda. Here are four principles that, in my view, sum up the Chris Rabb I know. Number one, rights are not a zero-sum game. Number two, if justice is what love looks like in public, as distinguished uh, Dyson lecturer Cornell West said, then justice can go viral if we value each other and we love with full hearts. Third, budgets, tax codes, environmental laws, and civil rights laws are moral documents as much as they are legal. And number four, we all have a role to play in this ongoing and fragile experiment we call democracy on this one precious planet of ours. Please join me in welcoming the 2023 Dyson Lecturer, my friend, Chris Rabb. Good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm a little upset at you. Um, I'll tell you why. Uh, Professor uh, Crawford uh, puts me in situations that take me out of my comfort zone, and I don't much care for that. I, uh, I'm so appreciative of you, uh, despite you doing this to me. You know, the dean was talking about Cornell West, and I'm like, what, what are you setting me up for? Why are you, what are you doing to me? And that, that anxiety, like who, who wants to speak after Cornell Webb? Rest, Ra raise your hand. No, no, it's consensus here. But here I am. So I feel a little out of sorts. How, how am I going to compare to someone like that? And 
I'm not a lawyer, not a legal scholar. What am I doing here? Don't, you don't have to answer that. Um, so the reason I'm upset is because she's pulled me out of my comfort zone. Because I don't know if I belong here. You know what I mean? I don't know if I belong here. But when you read my resume and you see all these glowing things that are, you know, the, the facts, they're, they're pretty factual, I guess. I can fit in. So, oh, okay, well, those validators that the dean and the professor said, oh, okay, well, yeah, I kind of get, he's no Cornet West, but I get it, you know. You know, I fit in. Oh, yeah. See, belonging and fitting in are not synonymous. Are they? No. So fitting in is kind of adjusting yourself to get in there using whatever tools or opportunities you have to assimilate in a particular moment, a particular space, particular group of people, you can fit in. I fit in. But belonging is a much deeper sensibility. Belonging is really about connectedness. It's about connectedness. And it's about the place that you inhabit in that given moment accepting you for who you are, where you don't have to adjust or hide. You're embraced for just being you. Resume, no resume, personal connections. I accept you. Both are important, not synonymous. And it's important in this moment, belonging, sense of community, engagement. It's important in these trying times, in these extraordinarily trying times. People want to know, what am I doing here? What's my motivation? How do I feel seen? And we ask ourselves this our entire lives. And these are relevant questions. So being here in this moment outside of my comfort zone still has value. Because my hope today is that I can find a way to connect with all of you who I've never met before, with a few exceptions, to figure out some stuff together in this society in flux. And a lot of it has to do with identity. So you see, almost 30 years ago, I started an extraordinary journey, figuring out who my people were. Because I was raised around a lot of people, like I knew all four of my grandparents and they knew all four of their grandparents. Well, why is that relevant in my family? Well, my 16 great-great-grandparents were all born in states where slavery was the state law, from as far south as Mississippi to far north as New York. New York. I have enslaved ancestors from New York. But on the very first day of formal genealogical research, I was 23 years old. I went to the National Archives. I was working in Washington, D.C. for my U.S. Senator, Carol Mosley Braun, first black woman senator. I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and when I wasn't working there, I was doing genealogical work with people 50 years older than me on my little laptop, my little genealogical software. No inter internet people. That's pre-internet. That existed. Pre-internet. Thank you. So on my very first day of formal genealogical research, I found my father's 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 father. 
in the 1880 U.S. Census, state of Mississippi, Jack Rabb. This was my grandfather's grandfather. I scrolled to the right and not scroll like this with a finger. That was not a thing. Okay. Birthplace of father, Africa. Birthplace of mother, Africa. What? Jackpot. I'm a genius. I'm the best genealogist ever. My very first day of, of research, I go back to Africa. That was 1994. 29 years later, about 5,000 people more in my family tree. I've gotten no closer to Africa than on that very first day. But why was I looking to begin with? I wanted to know who my people were. Can, can you relate to that, any of you? Who are my people? Whether it's blood, whether it's, who, who are my people? I want to know more. Because my grandfather had died, Maurice Rabb Sr. There weren't a lot of Rabs around. It was a small family. So I asked my grandma, his wife, I said, Grandma, you know, where the Rabs come from? Like, you know, what's their story? She's like, they're from Mississippi, but I don't know much more. I'm a miller. My people are from Kentucky. I'm like, okay, we can get to your people in a second, but I want to, like, what's the, what's the surname Rab? Where does that come from? What's, what's, the, what's the story there? And so for years, I did that work. But why? Why does it matter? Why do I care about some ancestor 200 years ago? What does it have to do with me in this moment? or in that moment in my 20s. Social identity is significant. How we process it, how society reveals and influences identity, all very important. And the very value of our humanity. As I said, all 16 of my great-great-grandparents were born into states where slavery was a state law. Most of them were, in fact, enslaved. Some of them were enslaved by their own fathers. Deep, huh? So I'm trying to get back to Africa. On my first day, I get there, and then Africa's like, see you later. So I keep digging and digging, but what I come up against are the white people who owned my people. And then finding out that many of those who owned my ancestors were in fact my ancestors as well. So I'm 23 years old and I'm uncovering rapist after rapist after rapist after rapist. The psychological impact of trying to find my people, I'm bumping up against rapists who are no less my ancestors than the black folk who I'm yearning to connect with. I was not ready for that journey, but I persisted because I had to make a decision very early on that I would not let the misdeeds of others, generations before I was even a thought, impact my own self-worth. And I had to make the distinction between ancestry and heritage. Let me break that down for you. Ancestry is just what you are. It's your ancestors, it's your pedigree, it's your parents, grandparents, eight, grand, eight great grandparents, 16, et cetera, 32, 64, you get it. Genetically, that's what makes you up. That's ancestry. Heritage is very different. So ancestry is kind of what you are, who you come from. Heritage is about who you choose to become. 
You have choice over that. We all inherit certain things culturally, but we don't have to accept it all. There are parts of our heritage that we lean into, that we love, that we feel good about, that kind of validates us. And there are other parts of our heritage that may inspire shame. Or you just say, I don't want to bring that with me to the next generation. Does that make sense? Can you relate to that? There, there are traumas. There are practices and mindsets that we don't much care for, that maybe we experienced as children, or we heard about those types of experiences in previous generations, and you say, you know what? Not on my watch. I'm not going to take that. That's a cultural heirloom. I'm going to leave over there on that dusty mantle place. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into this other stuff that has informed my social identity and sense of self. So ancestry, we have no choice. You can look for Frederick Douglass or George Clooney or whomever you want to pop into your family tree. It ain't going to happen unless it's actually real. But we can make choices about how we process the decisions, the life experiences, the values that have transmitted in a transgenerational way. So this thing of genealogy and there are a lot of genealogists who, who do this work for different reasons. They may be looking for a celebrity. They may be looking for money. They may be looking for really finding cousins. Any number of reasons. They're all valid. Um, for me, it was really kind of putting meat on the bone to stories I'd heard growing up about some of the people that I, I, I heard about. And the gentleman in the, on the right with the apron is my great-grandfather, Alan Rabb. His father was Mad Jack Rabb, the gentleman I showed you on the previous census listing. And he built a very successful business that he inherited from his father in Columbus, Mississippi, which is saying a lot because any random white person could have just bombed that very successful black business, which was the norm all across the South and the West for centuries. That business died um, as a result of the Great Depression, but it allowed my great-great-grandfather to pass it along to his eldest son, Alan. And that wealth created from that business that employed a number of black folk in, this, in the town allowed for my great grandfather to say to his six sons, if you wanna leave the state and get an education, I'll pay for it, wherever you wanna go. At the turn of the century, That's extraordinary. One went off to serve in World War I. Another one went to Northern Mississippi, AKA Chicago, um, and worked for Al Capone. He came home in a box quite young in life. One became a professional violinist. One became a photographer. My grandfather, who was, I believe, number three out of six, loved to learn. He was a nerd, loved to learn, top of his class. But in Mississippi, you weren't allowed to go to past 10th grade if you're a Negro. You see, Negroes didn't have the mental capacity to understand you know, complex thoughts and such. So it didn't matter that his, his father, his grandfather were fairly wealthy, he was black. So he had to leave the state to pursue his love of learning. And he did. So I know that I descend from folks who have a real strong interest 
in education and service. And it has informed a lot of the decisions that I've made even before college. But this sense of connectedness is also related to privilege. Because I know a ton of white people. I've met several hundred over my years. I don't know a lot of white folk who have college educated ancestors that far back. They exist. And maybe some of you are one of those folks who have a long line of folks with formal education or background. But it's pretty rare going back multiple generations. It is extremely rare for a black family to have six generations college education. So I'm number six. I got a 20 year old who's in college now, he's seven. If you add the enslaving white ancestors, it's 10 generations. And I'll get to that. So even though I'm not independently wealthy or dependently wealthy, I'm doing okay. I have occupational prestige. I'm cisgender. Um, I chose to be a heterosexual in fifth grade when the straights came to me with their pamphlets. And I said, oh, that looks about right. No, is that not how, that's not how that happened? I have a, I have a bad memory. Okay, so, you know, I got that stuff that some people called unearned privilege, whatever. It's, it's worked very well for me. The black part, not so much, um, but these other things are extraordinary offsets. What do we do with that privilege? How does it fold into our identity and sense of um, purpose? We all have different sites of privilege. All of us. What do we do with it? That's a loaded question. So I have a little montage here of, <laughs> I pulled off my phone, you can tell from up there. <laughs> Different moments in my life. There's my granddad. This is the granddad who, who escaped Mississippi to pursue formal education, talking to Dr. King. He was a badass. He caused a lot of good trouble. Up at top, it's hard for you to see, is a picture of the first black mayor of Chicago where I was born and raised. That's Harold Washington, who was iconic in Chicago and nationally being one of the first black mayors of a major city in the 1980s. My big brother, my mom, who worked for him, which was like super bragging rights as a kid. And my grandma and my dad, who also were doing amazing work in different fields. And my grandma there was the one who set me on my, my journey around genealogy because she hired me to do the work of documenting a connection between our black family and a very influential white family that some of you may have heard of. I talked before about the distinction between ancestry and heritage. Now you're not supposed to understand this right here. This is just a visualization of who my people are in terms of my pedigree, which in genealogical terms means your ancestry. It doesn't include your cousins, your siblings, nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles. These are just the progenitors before you. It's an upside down triangle. Paternal side, maternal side. That's what makes me, me, biologically. But you can superimpose other things onto a family tree and say, what are some trends that have occurred over generations? So I have ethnicity of my African ancestors based on DNA tests tests I, I've been taking over the past 20 years. I'm probably the most genetically well-documented person you've ever met. Do with that what you will. But you can superimpose any number of, of things that go beyond biology or ethnicity onto any chart you create. 
So you could talk about formal education. You can talk about religious affiliation. You can talk about occupation, any number of things, geography. But where am I going with this? A resume is a piece of paper that can validate you in certain circumstances. And there, there is value in that. And there is society that can validate you or do quite the opposite based on the body you inhabit or the language you speak or your immigration status or any number of things. Our government does that. Society as a whole can do that. And here's an example of how government viewed black people. Also in Columbus, Mississippi, I believe 1860, where another enslaver ancestor of mine, George Harris, had a lot of assets. In this particular circumstance, those assets were human beings. So that big red ellipse represents all the human beings that he owned. It references their gender, their complexion, and their age. Society did not really embrace those Black people's full humanity. And somewhere potentially on there is one of my ancestors that I've yet to formally connect to their father. But they didn't have enough value to be treated as human beings because slavery was the state law and that's just not, it's not how it worked. But they were valuable enough in the service of wealth accumulation to be documented. You understand the distinction? So they're important enough to be documented because they were assets of very rich people. And as you all probably are learning in law school that there's a lot of documentation the, the, the wealthier a person is and all the tax implications associated with that, et cetera, et cetera. But they were not important enough to be considered whole, to have value in and of themselves. They didn't belong, but they were forced to fit in in service of wealth creation for the people that own them. I referenced some of my ancestors who inspired me whose values have been transmitted over time, over generations, and imbued a sense of urgency in me from a very young age. Sometimes people do this work because they want to be connected to fabulosity. That's a real word. I made it up years ago. Like, I want to be, you know, who are my people? Well, I want to be connected to someone who has high status because that'll make me feel better about myself because otherwise I'm just a nobody. Who am I? What value do I bring? But if I can be connected to someone of great status, <laughs> well, I got that too. This is a very high status white person. Anyone know who this person is? Any history buffs? All right. Has anyone heard of the Declaration of Independence? All right, he's one of the 56 signers from New York. His name was Philip Livingston. In his family, he was known as Philip the Signer Livingston. And the reason he was known as the Signer was because in this family, everyone was named Philip, which really sucked for me as a genealogist. <laughs> I found the Philip. Oh wait, there's 17 others all in the same county. Um, Philip the Signer Livingston was a great man because he signed the Declaration of Independence. What you don't know about this famous New Yorker is that he was a part of a five, six generation lineage of mass human traffickers. I mean, massive. This family owned thousands of people, but not in New York, it was just a few. Because you know, it's New York, you know. But one of those people was my ancestor, Christiana. Her mother was plucked from a plantation in Jamaica 
where the Livingstons owned five plantations. She was plucked away as a little girl and brought to Manhattan in the late 1700s. And her grandson raped her. That's my connection to the Livingstons. Now, some of you may say, well, how could you definitively know that? Well, she was a child, so there's a whole no consent thing. She was property, again, no consent. And there, there's no documentation to suggest that that person considered their descendants to be of any value at all beyond service of their lifestyle. Not an easy thing to swallow. High status. Now this guy is my ancestor no less so than any one of my African ancestors in that same generation. But this dude is in family. He's a relative. Can you, do you know where I'm going with this? Like any of you have a cousin you're really close to, raise your hand if you have a cousin that you're close to, regardless of their first or their whatever, and they may have a sibling that you don't ever talk to. Well, they're siblings. You have the exact same connection, but your family, you're a relative. Because we're connected beyond blood. We have the same blood, but we've lit, we grew up together. I didn't grow up with you. So I have an ability to, I had an opportunity to connect with you in ways that I now connect with you. These, these distinctions matter. Ancestry, heritage, family, relatives, it's all connected. And how it informs how we navigate in the world in a time of great flux, particularly when we want to know what we do with what we've been given. How are we supposed to show up? How do we define community when we desperately need that? When we're, we don't want to feel alone, we don't want to feel estranged, we want some direction. Who are our people beyond blood? beyond nationality, but who we're connected to in meaningful ways as you define meaning, not by anyone else. They define value in a very narrow way. It was status, wealth, and power. But power works in a lot of different ways. Power can be used as a cudgel. Power can be used as a way to create. The choice is ours. These assholes, they're family, or they're relatives, right? They're part of my family. Um, spared no expense to capture children, et cetera, who for some reason wanted to run away from their warm embrace as enslavers. They spent a lot of effort to collect their assets. Now, I don't know if this was an ancestor of mine who they're, they were trying to catch, but they were very interested in the concentration of power and wealth. And this is a black person right here, but any, any Irish people here? Any folks of Irish descent? Bridget, really? Oh, okay. Um, Uh, any Germanic people here? Okay. Yeah, they didn't much care for any of you. They, they conscripted people from, they're called the Palatines, uh, from modern day Germany and other places, um, and treated them awfully. Irish? Awfully. Well, and neither of those groups were considered white back in the 1700s or 1800s. So they weren't really friendly people unless it was a cousin. And most of my Livingston lineage, they intermarried. They only married other Livingstons. I have a, I have a um, 
relative named Livingston Livingston, just to give you a sense. That's a real thing. So in service of what? You have this great status. You have all this wealth. These Livingstons in New York State owned a million acres of land at one point. That's larger than the footprint of Rhode Island. They owned it within their family. And that wealth created opportunities for uh, generations to do all kinds of things, some of which were actually pretty decent. There are white abolitionist descendants of these awful people. John Jay, they married into, John Jay was married into Livingston family, so there's a lot of Livingstons come from him and his wife. A lot of wealthy, influential people were connected to the Livingstons. Not all of their practices and behaviors and accomplishments were sorted. It's like any family. There is an array of fabulosity and yumminess and debauchery and evil. When you have 5,000 people in your family tree and you just conservatively, 1% are just like aggressive assholes, you know what I mean? Like that's 50 people. That's a lot of people who are just like the worst, the dregs of society. I'm claiming that I'm certain that at least 1% of my family tree is filled with people from all backgrounds who are just aggressively awful human beings. I don't know, maybe it's a half a percent. It's still a lot of people because we all are connected through blood to thousands and thousands of people. All right. How does this relate to where we are in a society where we are kind of discussing issues of equity and privilege and access and opportunity, particularly in light of this SCOTUS decision that has all but dissolved affirmative action in higher education? This may come off as a little hypocritical. You may recall that I graduated from Yale College. It's a fairly fancy institution. It is egregiously wealthy in terms of their uh, um, endowment, all of those things. Very true. But is Yale inherently better than any other institution of higher learning? If you took away that endowment and you put it here, that's a game changer. That financial wealth creates extraordinary opportunity for the people who have true access to it. Because there's something that is important to understand. There is opportunity and then there is access. Opportunity is more of a potential. It is a statement of a, a, a value statement. Like we believe in opportunity. It is very important. It is part of the narrative that we've created in our society about opportunity for all. But the quality and breadth of opportunity in this nation is deeply connected to privilege and social identity. So to me, affirmative action at its best was only a remedial approach to the symptoms of larger systemic issues that had great value because I don't know if I would have gotten into Yale without affirmative action. I'm very comfortable admitting it now, was not comfortable admitting it in 1988 because the way it was processed by folks from without was that, oh, the only reason you're here is because you're black, which I found adorable because I'm standing in front of the Livingston Archway in Branford College. It's one of the 12 dorms at, at, at Yale College. Now, I didn't know this existed until two years after I graduated because I may have burnt down the building. Um, but this Livingston that it's named after is the father of the dude in the red cloak. He sent his four sons to Yale and was the first benefactor of Yale Divinity School. Now, I'm sure they were all geniuses.
It's in the blood. So that's where genius comes from, from, you know, hemoglobin. Anyway, that is affirmative action before there was affirmative action. That's the real affirmative action. That's the affirmative, affirmative action that created the extraordinary structural inequality that we're digging ourselves out of as best we can. And affirmative action, the latest version, was a crumb. Most people don't go to college. Most people don't even apply to elite schools. So the destruction of affirmative action in higher education, particularly as it relates to elite institutions, is not as relevant to most Americans as people would think. Still important, still important. We need multiple tools. But here's the thing. Why do we need elite institutions to begin with? What is it about the artificial creation of scarcity that allows for these elite institutions to persist when the real thing that is, allows them to maintain that status is extraordinary financial wealth? Can you imagine all the wonderful things, because I believe Pace Law School is like number one for environmental law, right? Did I get that right? I used the Google before I got here, so I'm just making sure. You're already number one. What if we just took Yale's endowment and gave it to Pace Law School? Do you think that would have a, an impact on the scholarship and the, the capacity to do so much more? And might Yes, but here's the thing. We have so much financial wealth in the hands of so few. What would it mean if that wealth were more equitably distributed to allow more people, irrespective of their backgrounds, who don't have the social identity and connectedness that has been the norm for upward mobility and advancement in this country until very, well, well, even today. Yeah, right. Because I, I found out that there are more people who got into Yale just because of who their daddy was than um, uh, black folk. Like a lot more. Like, and that was something I didn't know. Um, so it persists despite all these other things we're talking about around diversity, inclusion, and equity. Here's the thing, and I, I want to end with this because I have 37 more pictures that I'm not going to show you. This is Christiana. Christiana is my great, great, great grandmother who died at 96 in 1912, 1906. She was born in 1812. And she grew up in New York. She told her stories to her granddaughter. Her granddaughter wrote a letter to her niece. Her niece shared those letters with my grandma who shared them with me before she died. I have been trying to trace the footprints of my ancestors for 30 years. Not to find Frederick Douglass or George Washington or whomever, but to really find out who my people are. She did not have wealth. She could read and write, but had really no formal education. No one knows her name outside of my family. She was a seamstress to the 1% of New York. Any haute couture outfit you see in that era in New York of the patrician class, her fingerprints might very well have been on their clothes. Died at 96 years old transmitted these stories through the generations, and it got to me. What a gift. What a gift. We all have gifts. What do we do with them? What do we do with them? That's your exploration. That's your exploration. You have to find out. You can't let it happen. You got to make it happen. But what I want you to start at is accepting this sometimes inconvenient truth. And that is that 
Everyone has a role. Everyone has a role. My grandma used to say that. And she was aggressively intelligent. But I thought it was a particularly trite saying of hers. Like, huh? Like, well, I don't get it. Until years later, well after she died, it means that there will become a moment. There will come a moment when the moment will call you to act. And in that role, you're going to have to step up. And it may be a role you did not anticipate. It may be a role that scares the living hell out of you. It may be a role that is 180 degrees from what you thought you would be doing in that moment. Rise to the occasion. Because it's just a moment. That moment may be extended. It could even last years. But your role will change over time. But in that moment, accept that role. We're not all going to be signers of the Declaration of Independence. We're not all going to be captains of industry. We're not all going to be fancy seamstresses. But you have a role to play. And if you can find a community of conscience that you can participate in that role with, it will give you so much wealth, the real wealth that matters, community wealth, the wealth that transcends finances and social status, that brings you joy, that gives you a sense of purpose. I implore you, I implore you to step up and acknowledge that role, especially if it's a role you did not want. I'm standing before you as the state representative in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, in the largest full-time state legislature in the country, in one of six swing states that determined who would become president, and may next year have an extraordinary influence over electoral politics. I'm not here as a partisan. I'm not here to tell you to pursue public service. I was called to it even though I didn't want to do it. They said to me, oh, uh, you should really run for the seat. It's an open seat. I said, but you would, you're asking me to drive 104 miles to the state capitol to be surrounded by fascists, and I got two little babies. That, that doesn't sound good to me, oddly enough. But then I thought about the people who came before me and I thought about the sacrifices they made, not just for their families, but for the communities of struggle that, that they connected with. And I said, it's not even an option. I have to do it. I have to run, even if I don't win. And to my great shock, I accidentally won. And I've been in the state legislature for four terms, and I love to serve. I hate politicians but I love to serve. We all have to find that within us, how we serve in any capacity. That is the role I speak of. It may be small, it may be transient, but it matters. How do I know it matters? Because I'm talking about ancestors who are quasi-literate from 200 years ago who none of you have heard of, and they've made a profound impact on my life. And I put that forward to help the 65,000 bosses I call my constituents, my children, whomever I can touch, because they've touched me. Open yourselves up to that possibility. I'm not asking you to pursue great wealth or high status, any of that stuff. But you have a role to play, especially now in this moment, especially as law students. Your impact individually and collectively can be awesome. And I'm here for it. This may be the reason I'm allowing myself to be outside of my comfort zone today, because if I can have any impact on any of you, then I know it was worth it. Because I've seen it in my own life.
people who I never met who are literally a part of my DNA. And I just want to thank you for letting me speak with you today because I feel that this is a moment. This is a moment where we can tap into our fabulosity. Thank you. So, uh, Chris, I'm going to be bold here and say that you have acquitted yourself well, and you are right up there with Dr. West yes. in the annals of Dyson Lecture. So thank you very much for that lecture. Uh, there will be a reception, not this moment, but following our Q&A in the tutor room. So please join us there. Um, first, though, Professor Crawford and I are going to present the Dyson Medal okay. to Mr. Rab. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. What? All right. And now we have a little time for q and I'm going to ask Rajil Toussaint and Tatiana Martin to come up for, uh, to moderate that Q&A session. Thank you. So if you've got a question, raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. Testing, hello? Over here. Oh, oh hi. Hey. So I really liked your like su very subtle distinction of like belonging and fitting in. Uh, honestly, I thought the picture was quite fitting because when, when I saw it, I, it clicked. Which picture are you referring to? The one with the uh, with the garlic and the orange. Oh, I, I love that. Wait, because it, it's such it's such a simple picture, but it, it portrays such a, a complicated idea. And I was wondering, has has your sense of belonging changed? And like, what gives you your sense of belonging now? Is it knowing where your family? comes from knowing like sort of this internal struggle of figuring out who you are or is it now your public service like the mission that that line has given you that's a great question oh my goodness thank you for that short answer is i don't know the longer answer is when you're a genealogist and family historian just as human beings we kind of cherry pick like most of us want to talk about all the good stuff. Um, I don't because I learn a lot in the discomfort and the lessons from the awfulness that occurred within my family tree because it's it's a deeply American story. Um, and you you can't really, you can understand everything about this country by my stories. It covers the gamut. I mean, what you had today was, you know, one one hundredth of one percent of the work I've done over thirty years. It's just the tip of the the um, tip of the spear. So we pluck different things, but some of the strands that have been consistent um, are service and education. When I say that I'm six generations college educated, it sounds very um, braggy. But the reason I mention it, particularly in groups um, that are pr predominantly white, is one is that's jarring, like, wait, he's black. How is that even possible? Like, my people haven't even been here two, three generations. How is someone going to have six generations? Right? So it's one, it's jarring. And two is, there is no direct correlation in my family between formal education and financial wealth because of structural racism. I, I had a very wealthy ancestor, a very wealthy ancestor in the turn of the century, who was a caterer to the 1% the, the of Baltimore in the Gilded Age. And he had a, a, a white, all of his patrons were white. He, 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 um, he couldn't pay his bill. So he gave him a piece of land in um, uh, Maryland where the ordinance said black people couldn't walk. So I had a wealthy black ancestor who was not allowed to visit the property that 
he acquired. Like that's a complexity and a nuance that speaks volumes. Belonging to me is about feeling I can be my authentic self in a space, in a place, in a group of people without having to explain anything, that I'm accepted for who I am. That's, that's what belonging means to me. But here's the other piece. And I, I kind of joked about this on the front end because we all have nerves when we're speaking and so so forth. But I have this mentality that I, I suggest you all think about if it's not something you've already done as a practice. But wherever you show up, think that's where I'm supposed to be. I'm not going to let anyone tell me I don't belong here. Some of this is about finding that internal locus of control where the outside validators are less important because you know who you are, you know your own value. And when you know your own self-worth, it's really hard to be intimidated. I will go in front of any audience, I will go anywhere, and I know that in that moment and in that space, that's where I'm supposed to be. And nobody's going to tell me otherwise. They may try to scream at me. They may call me awful things. They may do all sorts of things. But it's not the stimulus. It's the response. Because there's always going to be those negative stimuli that say, oh, sir, you don't belong here. What? Wait, no, you're not. That's them. You don't have to internalize that. And that has taken years to do, but is a practice that we can all develop. So that's my kind of circuitous answer to your question, which is really a great question. Yes. Okay, so I know you didn't really touch upon, um, you know, students for a fair admission uh, versus Harvard, but uh, my question is directly related to that. So looking forward, you know, um, I'm wondering if you can maybe elaborate um, on the intersection between, you know, you always hear of this, and I quote, proxy discrimination. Um, and my follow up to that is, you know, how do you see the alternatives that higher educations are going to start implementing to beat down on that bedrock, like you had mentioned before, standing outside of the dorm hall? There are there are proxies for race and ethnicity right now, lived experience. I mean, we're in such a segregated society where you could just say zip code. Your zip code in this country is one of the biggest predictors of social outcomes than almost any other factor. Zip code. So you can have a, a facially, you know, racially neutral indicator that speaks volumes. But it's more complicated than that because there are people who are discriminated against uh, irrespective of the geographic area that they live in, right? There's a perception that, well, how's a guy from Yale who went to Yale, six generations college educated, complaining about discrimination? Oh, poor you. But if we compare apples to apples, I have one-tenth of the financial wealth of a white working class person with no education, with no formal education. So if we're comparing apples to apples, that's significant because when you're talking about the racial wealth imbalance, wealth, financial wealth has a huge, huge impact on everything, health outcomes, uh, uh, formal educational attainment, um, everything, employment, all of these things. So I found the SCOTUS decision to be lazy, ahistorical, contemptuous. But I also know that affirmative action was never going to be the silver bullet for leveling the playing field. It never was supposed to be the only thing or the primary thing. Affirmative action doesn't address any of the systemic issues that I've referenced, not a one. But here's the thing, and I said it, you know, I alluded to it before, why, why are 
I mean, these elite institutions were really just for rich white guys from the right families with the right religious affiliations. Right, I mean, that that they were set up. King's College, Columbia University, was literally founded to educate the sons of enslavers, or what we say in history books is merchants. So we can't have this discussion without talking about what the default has been for centuries. We can't say, well, this is the playing field, because there never was a meritocracy. That's a joke. And back in the bad old days, merit was, wasn't even a thing. It was just bloodline. So if we're going to have this discussion in earnest, we need to have the real discussion about the historical context in which these institutions were created. And we're not doing that. We're playing around on the margins because we're not ready to have the real conversation about the origins of our nation and, and our narrative around opportunity. I mean, this is a nation born of, of stolen land and stolen labor. That's just a fact. It's very uncomfortable for a lot of people. But if the people who are discomforted by that very bold but accurate statement don't want to have the conversation and they're controlling admissions, we're not moving forward. So how we talk about um, upward mobility, access, merit, that is a loaded word. Where are the spaces where we can have those conversations in earnest and not try to score points on each other, but just like dig in? And that doesn't happen at the Supreme Court level. That happens at institutions like this. It happens in all kinds of spaces because only until you understand that the decisions we're making now are legacies of decisions we refused to make generations ago that got us to this point. There, there are things that I, I, I wouldn't even be able to talk about previously in a society that would be would hold what I'm saying in contempt. I've only recently say, said publicly, use the terms like white supremacy and structural inequality, because it scares a bunch of people in positions of power and influence. But it's no less true. And even if you don't say it, the effects of those isms are killing people every day. So there's no short answer to your question, but if we're just having a conversation up here, the tip of the iceberg, but the real stuff is below the surface that we refuse to acknowledge, nothing is gonna change. And that may be part of the roles we take on, is daring to challenge those assumptions expectations, long-standing public narratives about what is appropriate, what is meritorious, what is privilege. We got to do that work. And frankly, this is a great place to start right here. And I'm all for it. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you all again for coming out. Please join us in the tutor room. Um, for a reception. Representative Rab will be joining us as well. And thank you again for coming out.